I'm a planner. Buying my first home? I had a plan. My daughter's graduation? I had a plan. And as hard as it was to repair a flooded basement, <laughs> I had a plan. H.P. Lovecraft once said, The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. This sentiment provided the framework for Lovecraft's writings, which would go on to inspire countless works of horror and science fiction even to this day. And where video games proved to be just as effective at telling stories as any book, movie, or television show, there were bound to be those that would take that Lovecraft path into the unknown. Hey! Thanks for watching today's episode of The Completionist. Today's episode is brought to you by Cove and their new headphones, the Cove 101 and Active Noise Canceling Bluetooth headphones. These bad boys have up to 32 hours of listening time, whether it be music or communicating with your friends, because yes, there is a HD microphone built into these bad boys. You have up to over 700 hours of passive time, meaning if these things are just on, you can listen to them, or you can just have them on and not worry about having to recharge it right away. And the nice thing about this too is that it has beautiful foam padding for your ears. So it feels comfortable, it feels good, and these things pack a punch with the bass. Let's get some big bad bosses going real quick. I'll show you guys, even when I'm not wearing them. Pretty powerful stuff. So if you want to pick up these bad boys, head over to coveaudio.com slash TC68 to get over 67% off for some awesome holiday savings. Again, that's coveaudio.com slash TC68. And hey, everyone who picks one of these bad boys up supports the show. So hey, if you get some, thank you very much. Thank you to Cove Audio for supporting us. Thank you so much. And now back to the show. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Today, we're tackling Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem, a game that not only have I been wanting to cover for years, but apparently some of you guys on my Patreon have been wanting me to cover it as well. This game was determined by those in the mini producer tier at patreon.com slash the completionist. The next thing we are accepting suggestions for are Mario spinoffs. So if you want to join in on the vote, consider joining us over at the completionist Patreon. Links on that are in the description box down below. Eternal Darkness Sandy's Requiem brings back some great memories for me, especially during high school. When it came out almost 20 years ago, it was such a unique experience that I had to share it with all of my friends. I'd invite some of them over, pop in the game, toss in the controller, and watch this game mess with them the way that it messed with me. And as I reflected on the first time that I completed this game, I realized I never, I never did. I've never actually beaten it before. I'm now curious to know how well this game holds up in the action horror genre, and that there's more to it than the gimmicks that I enjoyed all those years ago. So join me as we complete Sunshine of the Mind's Requiem, Eternal Darkness of the Spotless Insanity, S -S Sunshine Darkness Eternal System Memory, Mac 2, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. Let's begin. I'd argue that Lovecraft's take on fear of the unknown is not only accurate, but all-encompassing. The unknown can be absolutely freaking anything, whether the thing lurking behind the dark corner is a zombie, a serial killer, a demon, or your own grief made manifest into an LGBTQ icon. Fear is ultimately subjective, and we all have different things that make us throw our hands up in the air and say, nope. For me, it's evil farmers. Any normal dude can be scary, but you throw agriculture into the mix and don't ask me why, I'm out. So if different things have different effects on different people, how does a horror game ensure that every player feels the same effect? Well, if you're Eternal Darkness, you create a revolutionary game mechanic and force the effect on your protagonist. You play as Alex Royvis, who travels to her grandfather's Rhode Island mansion after hearing of his gruesome, mysterious death. With some brief investigating, she discovers her grandfather's Tome of Eternal Darkness and its connection to the ancient supernatural world. Pages from the tome have been hidden throughout the mansion, and as Alex finds them, 
we as the player then get to take on the role of 11 previous tome owners throughout history. A Khmer slave dancer with dreams of an extraordinary life, a Persian swordsman desperate to win a mysterious woman's affection, and even a middle-aged Edward Royvis, Alex's grandfather, to name a few. Ten of the previous tome holders paved the way for Alex to defeat the first owner, Pius Augustus, and the powerful ancient being he aligned with. Eternal Darkness plays similar to that of a classic Resident Evil game, from laying out hordes of monsters, to the way you interact with items in your inventory and environment, to the puzzles you solve along the way. It's obvious that, despite throwing shade at its story, Eternal Darkness borrows a lot from Resident Evil. The main differences are that Eternal Darkness adds an intuitive targeting system to its combat, there's more an emphasis on melee combat, and you get to use magic. Oh cool, I love magic! No, not magic, magic. What's magic? It's like magic, but pretentious. Explain. Sure, okay. <clears throat> magic is like, Pia! while magic is more like, Oof. but if anyone knows anything about Eternal Darkness, it's these two words. Sanity effects. Not only do players have to maintain their health and manage their spell casting like in many other games, but they need to preserve sanity as well. And when the green bar gets low, shit gets weird. We're walking on ceilings. We're sinking through floors. One pill makes you larger. One pill makes you smaller. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Now, Nintendo must have realized that they had something special on their hands because they chose to do something they had never done before. Eternal Darkness was one of the very first games published directly by Nintendo. No third party to have an M rating. That's right. Bops in the head are now machetes to the face. Sunny green hills are now bloodstained cult sanctuaries. Does a brightly colored elixir help you you regain sanity? No, but straight Tennessee whiskey does. Look, let's face it, Nintendo is the Disney of video games, and just as Disney stepped out of its comfort zone with the Pirates movies and the PG-13 rating, this game was the ship Nintendo boarded to venture into the unfamiliar waters of rated M for Mature. And although some may point at the numerous challenges they and Silicon Knights faced along their journey, many would argue that it was worth it. Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem was proof that Nintendo's choice not to compete in M-rated games is, in fact, a choice. They don't want to directly compete, but they totally could if they wanted to. Now that I have the focus that I lacked in adolescence, I knew it was time to look past the shimmering tinsel of sanity effects and fully see what Eternal Darkness had to offer. Halfway through my first playthrough, I was noticing some patterns. Now let's start with the environments. The Forbidden City I explored in the first chapter as Pius, I would explore a couple chapters later as Kareem and twice more down the line. I hacked my way through the Cambodian temple as Elia, only to return to the same location as Dr. Lindsay. The monastery I visited as Anthony, I'd see twice more and the Royvis estate is explored three times by the three playable characters of the Royvis family. I've seen repetition like this before, and my first thought is, well, lazy game design. Whether it's because of a lack of time, resources, ability, or a combination of the three. Repeating an environment throughout the game is the red flag that signals we cut corners. Then there's the combat. Each character has the potential to obtain at least one melee weapon and one projectile weapon. As the game progresses, any spells learned by one character gets passed on to the next by the means of the Tome of Eternity. Eternal Darkness. As great as it was to have offensive, defensive, and item buff spells, I found it way easier to run from enemy to enemy, chop off their heads to immobilize them, and, with nothing by headless monsters in the room, take my sweet time in hacking up these now harmless foes. This tactic kept working, so if the game wasn't going to change, neither would my combat style. Last is the manner of how the story progresses. The Royvis Estate of the year 2000, the one Alex explores between chapters, acts like sort of an overworld in the game. Alex finds a tome entry in the estate, we then play as the subject of said entry, then come back to Alex who finds another entry, and then we play as that subject of that entry, and as you can see, it's not hard to see the formula here. These are patterns that I noticed in a single playthrough, and the thing is, I had to do three entire playthroughs in order to achieve the ultimate ending. This game was so rife with repetition that I felt like I was heading towards a tiresome pit of eternal darkness, and I wasn't going to climb out happy. That being said, I give this game my completionist rating of Sacrifice It. Sacrifice it. Wait, hold up, no, that's not right. This game was so rife with repetition that I felt like I was heading towards a tiresome pit of eternal darkness and I wasn't going to climb out happy. 
but I am so glad to report that any concerns I had were really off base. Despite its repetitive structure, this game remains engaging. I'd go so far to say that the repetition enhances the overall experience. Take the environments for example. While each one repeats at least once during a playthrough, it makes perfect sense given the game's story. If one character finds an artifact of the ancients but dies at the end of the chapter, it adds up that another character would need to travel to that same location years later to retrieve it. Furthermore, even though the environments repeat, they refrain from being repetitive. The game manages to change just enough from chapter to chapter to reveal something new about the location while simultaneously calling back to prior events. The temple Dr. Lindsay visits in the 1980s is more overgrown and has way more booby traps than when Elia was caught inside eight centuries prior. Lindsay's puzzle solving skills gets him safely to the lower levels, though he manages to get a good glimpse of the trap door opening that one once dropped Elia down there. It was surprisingly interesting to see how a simple monastery evolved into a cathedral for the Inquisition, and then again into an infirmary for World War I soldiers. And if Anthony manages to get the proficient two-edged sword at the monastery, Paul Luther has a chance to obtain it centuries later when he visits the same location. My overall take on the repeating environments is that the game was either designed to be that way from the very, very beginning, or if the developers were trying to give themselves a break, they were smart enough to integrate the repetition into the story, but not every element of this game is repetitive. Combat is something that I assumed would get stale, but the game proved otherwise. Yeah, I was running around enemies and chopping off their heads until the bitter end, but completing the game with three playthroughs made me realize how well the challenge increased. There were more and more instances where the decapitate and sidestep tactic just didn't fly. I was impressed by how seamlessly Eternal Darkness ramped up the difficulty, not only from the beginning to the end of my playthrough, but from my first playthrough to my second and to my third. When playing as Pius Augustus near the beginning of the game, you get to choose an artifact belonging to one of three powerful ancient beings. The artifact you choose it dictates the types of enemies you come across for the remainder of the playthrough, along with some minor differences in the cutscenes. Choosing the green artifact allows enemies to easily drain your sanity. Choosing the blue artifact allows them to easily drain your magic. And choosing the red artifact means that enemies are tougher to kill and do way more damage. The artifacts are like difficulty settings built into the game. Now what I like about the system is that this forces me to change up my combat tactics depending on the enemies I'm facing, especially with the more challenging red alignment. Instead of barging in head on swinging a sword, I now have to weigh my options. Do I cast a shield on myself and then go in swinging? Do I magically enhance my sword and rush in? Do I enhance my projectile weapon and shoot from afar? Do I summon a damaging barrier and lure my enemies into it? Or do I kill the monster by summoning a bigger monster? These are just some of my options. My point is, I'm no longer just hacking and slashing. I'm thinking. Combat doesn't remain repetitive because the game punishes me for trying the same tactic every time. I'm constantly switching things up. I'm engaged. In regards to the formula of Alex finds an entry, we play as a new character, Alex finds an entry, we play as a new character, it's back to that good repetition I was talking about. It works because every entry Alex finds in the Roybus estate is retrieved by utilizing the skills learned in the previous chapters. If Anthony learned a new spell that allows him to mend objects, guess what? Alex is about to use that spell to mend a key and gain access to a new part of the mansion. Gaining new spells acts kind of like collecting a bunch of power stars, but instead of getting access to the princess's secret slide, you get to witness the grisly triple murder that took place 200 years ago. It's the game's way of piecemealing new information to the player so as to not overwhelm them. Little by little, we gain new abilities, access new areas, and face harder and harder challenges. It's repetitive in structure, but with twists along the way. It's smart. The formulaic progression keeps the player engaged by introducing something new only when they're ready to use it. As a GameCube exclusive, Eternal Darkness obviously has no achievements or trophies to earn, and since it was never ported to any future platform, it stayed that way. I'm glad it did because I could only imagine the bullshit that someone would retroactively apply to a game such as this. Complete a playthrough without saving. Ugh, no thank you. But most of what the game does provide beyond merely beating it is pretty obtainable and pretty worth it. Most characters come standard with one or two weapons right away, but there are a few weapons that require special action in order to obtain. I mentioned the two-edged sword 
power that Anthony can receive during his story. This is achieved by having just a tiny bit of combat prowess and saving an NPC from a group of monsters. You're rewarded with the sword, which is far better than the weapons you start with. And also, as mentioned, it can also be found by Paul Luther during his story. In the same fashion, players can receive the key for Edward's elephant gun by protecting the house servants from an invisible monster. It's a powerful gun, and with some magical enhancement, it's a damn powerful gun that makes this trek to the underground city of Enga way easier. And as long as Kareem and Roberto don't gloss over collecting two jeweled statues during their respective chapters, Michael can then obtain the enchanted Gladius for Alex to use in the game's final chapter. The sword is clutch for defeating the final boss in that you're not required to spend the magic nor time being vulnerable to enchant it yourself. It never runs out of power, so you can use your precious moments to cast other spells or to interrupt your enemies. I appreciated not only the fact that these optional weapons were extremely useful, but that they were generally hard to miss. As long as you're paying attention and aren't being too passive, they're bound to wind up in your possession. But the main piece of completion criteria from Eternal Darkness is achieving the game's secret ending by completing three entire playthroughs each with a different artifact alignment. Despite my fear of repetition, I'll emphasize how the game provided enough variation and challenge to remain engaging throughout the completion. And I won't spoil it, but the secret ending goes full Lovecraft and goes far enough to explain why you're completing three different playthroughs instead of just making it an arbitrary challenge. And as far as secret endings go, I thought it was pretty cool. Is it worth doing three entire playthroughs to see something that can now just be found with a quick search on YouTube? <laughs> Uh, no, not really. That might have been enough to fill a completionist's appetite back in 2002, but for today's standards, I'll admit, I'm a spoiled boy and I want more. Though I remained engaged, I can look back and say that I would have preferred to stop and play a new game rather than finish that last playthrough. But credit where credit is due. The fact that the game's three playthrough completion criteria is immersed into the story is something that I don't see very often, and I'd love to see more games follow this example. While I completed Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem, there were 20 deaths. Most of those happened in my third playthrough with the red alignment. 12 spells learned. I probably had the most fun with Damage Field as it bought me time to get tactical. Four runes found. Once you find the optional purple rune, why bother with the other ones, am I right? 42 hours of gameplay, taking my time with the first playthrough and speeding through the others. And four times where my game actually glitched on me and I didn't believe it because I was playing Eternal Darkness. When I played Eternal Darkness all those years ago, I knew that... Oh, God damn it. I knew that I had something special on my hands, but I just didn't comprehend how special it actually was. And as I got older and started talking about the game a lot more on the show over the years, I realized that I never actually got to go full completionist on it like I've always wanted to. And I'm thankful that I did because not only did I get to relive those iconic sanity effects in the game, but I was able to also enjoy its weird love crafting and dive into the unknown to completion for the very first time. It was fun to witness the motifs that carried from one character's story to another and have everything converge with Alex in her final chapter. And if we're back in the year 02, where the only way to see the game's bonus ending was to beat it three times, then I might say to go for, for it and complete the game. But as we're now in the 2-0, I'd recommend playing it once on the easy green alignment, and if you enjoyed it, once more on the red challenging red alignment. And then, if you're lazy, you can just YouTube the rest, which leaves me conflicted. If I were to have completed this game when it first came out, I'd absolutely say it's worth it. But with the ease of the internet, knowing what happens right away, and knowing that Silicon Knights would eventually never produce a sequel or follow up to anything close to what this game is, it's difficult to say what it should be. I don't believe in half rings anymore, and I'm sticking to my guns with that. And in this case, this is where I'm going to land. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. Complete It.